Then we have the avatar of Krishna. And in very early on from Krishna's childhood, it became clear that this child is unafraid. It became then um, Radha was much older than him and all the, all the men and women in his village were in love with Krishna and he would play the flute and they would run after him like in a trance. So it represents the love in bhakti yoga of the bhaktas, of the devotees towards Krishna, where when they would hear the flute, they would forget to cook and they would go into in a state of yoga nidra or a trance where they were one with the divine. And um, in his childhood, he was precocious. In his teenage, he was uh, the, the heartthrob. And then he went in his youth. He he became, he destroyed, he became a statesman and he destroyed, uh, annihilated his own maternal uncle who was a narcissistic leader. And then uh, there were two families, the Pandavas and the Kauravas. They were one family split into two. They were fighting for a kingdom and he took side. He, he gave his allegiance to the side of the Pandavas that favored Dharma. And because he was uh, related to both, just like Ishwara is related to both the good and the bad and the ugly and the lovely people, he gave his army and his elephants, his might, to the other side, the non-dharmic side. But it was his counsel, his words that he spoke to Arjuna, one of the five Pandavas brothers, that became the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna's um, avatar, his story from childhood onwards, till he gave the Bhagavad Gita, and later on, is chronicled in the Mahabharata, his words of wisdom are throughout the Mahabharata and then a section of it is called the Bhagavad Gita. And also in a Purana, a later text called the Bhagavat Purana, the Bhagavat, B-H-A-G-W-A-T, in which a lot of his charitra or his qualities have been mentioned. And Lord says, you know, yada yada hi dharma se, lanir bhavati bhav, abhyudhana dharma se, atmanam sujadu. I don't, I means I, Ishwara, not I, Krishna, not I, friend of Pandavas, but I take birth or manifest, rather I manifest in body again and again, but only in those times when the collective dharma is in danger. And I come back to reset the dharmic cycle in Musha. So then that is how we understand that Ishwara came as Rama. Ishwara came as Krishna. There are some other avatars which I will gradually unfold to you. But another famous avatar is the Buddha. Although the Buddha founded a, a different religion or a different subheading of a religion called Buddhism. It has its close origins in the Vedic tradition. And um, what the Hindu Vedic people did was they declared the Buddha to be an avatar. And we all know that Buddha's teachings on mindfulness, meditation, the Four Noble Truths, all of these are very central to a yogic journey and inner yoga journey. And from an un understanding of avatar, an avatar, whether they are householders like Rama and Sita, so Rama and Sita, Krishna and Rukmini, or Krishna and his sweetheart Radha, or whether they are celibate like the Buddha, it does not matter. Their whole life is an example. Whole life is an example. And I think from this perspective of avatar, we can now understand from the same lens that definitely we will consider Jesus as an avatar. We will consider the 10 teachers of the Jain religion, the Tirthankars, as avatars. We would consider um, 
any humanized life that has been clearly from day one to day last defined by spiritual clarity, spiritual light and upliftment would be then considered an avatar. Teachers like myself who shine a lot of light, but I clearly write in my books how I also dealt with darkness. So I am not an avatar. I am a bhakta, a devotee, who may have come into this knowledge prior to you, many years ahead of you, and you can see what it does to you. But an avatar is clearly only possessing a human body, but none of the human um, wrestling between shadow and self. Many of us come clean and we are no longer wrestling and no longer, um, no longer under the attack of the tamsikratsik mind. Will you be a future avatar? This is all useless thinking. Avatar is that great cosmic consciousness taking on a supreme body for our purpose. And what is more, it is in the Vedic tradition, avatar is not just human. Avatar has also been taken in the form of a tortoise. Avatar has been also taken in the form of, um, you know, a special um, fish, a whale fish. So we will come to that when we come to that, the different avatars of Vishnu, etc. But the point is, yes, there is a concept of avatar. Please do not confuse it with the light of, um, you know, just, uh, it, it's, I only go by who the Shastra, the, our texts have, our tradition has declared it. Yes. And it has an effect on billions of people and it's always good. Even the recollection of the avatar, their story brings peace and brings better ideas within us. Then we come to the concept of deity, which I had mentioned also last time in my first satsang in April. A deity is an image, and an image can be drawn in, in wood, in metal, in stone, in earth, in sand, in gems, in um, in the mind itself, and on paper. I think there's one more substance. There are total six. I think I covered eight substances. Yeah, in eight substances, images can be drawn. Now, we've never seen, so we can draw, we can, most of us don't remember what Krishna looked like, Rama looked like. We also have our own Im imagination of Jesus. There is nobody living to say, I saw Jesus. Probably there is a mention of how they looked. For Rama and Krishna, we, we have less of a mention of how they looked, but more of how they appeared to the bhakta, different things to different people. So, a deity is definitely using the strokes of the imagination and the higher impulse of art, sacred art, to create symbolic or literal representations as per the heart of the bhakta. And a deity is what? A deity is an abstract understanding that if I have to find any kind of Shakti, any kind of power, or then it belongs to Ishwara, and that aspect of Ishwara is feminine, and we shall call it Durga. So who is Durga? Durga is a deity of Ishwara. And so whenever we channel the divine power, not the dirty power, not the games of the power, but the divine power that protects you and protects others, that lifts you and lifts others, that helps you transcend and helps transcend others, that power 
which is physical, which is intellectual, which is emotional, which is spiritual, which is electrical, which is mechanical, every kind of power, well, then the symbol of that is Durga. So Durga is not a woman, a divine woman who's floating about. No gods in the Vedic tradition just float about. Either they are avatars and they lead human journeys with exemplary, light-filled lives, or they are deities. And then they have, for example, Durga has 18 arms, 10 arms, or at least four arms, never shown with two arms. And each of those arms, multi the bulk of them would have weapons in them because these weapons represent the power. For example, if she's holding an ax, it's not just to chop off a head, but it's to chop off emotional entanglements, the clinginess, the foolishness with which we wind ourselves around and become disempowered versions of ourselves. So then when I remember Ishwara, oh Ishwara, I'm feeling powerless, then Durga comes in my mind, and then her axe comes in my mind, and then I use the axe to chop off a silly little habit or an entanglement. And that imagery contains the power of the whole universe and beyond. Because a deity is the image representation of the infinite power of Ishwara. Similarly, when I'm starting to write my book, or I start every morning, right? You start new. So where is all that wisdom? Where is that knowledge? Even my guru was created by something that transcends my guru, that is Ishwara. And when I remember all the knowledge, all the guidance, all the wisdom contained in Ishwara, then we see it as a feminine deity of Saraswati. And Saraswati is always symbolically shown on a white lotus representing sattva, wearing white flowing clothes, and holding on to japa mala or a water pitcher, purification. So all in all, when we start understanding the symbolism of the deity, what we are really understanding is the pure representation of sattva. And so we all have Saraswati within us, but some of us are able to bring her to the forefront of our consciousness. And then the writing that happens after that, or the poetry that you compose after that, or the art that you compose after recollecting that is not an ordinary mind, but a super mind, because it is connected with Saraswati Ishwa. From this understanding, now when we look at the Greek gods and goddesses, I don't know too much about them, but perhaps they can be considered deities from the Vedic language. Definitely, when we look at, you know, Ra, or the, the sun god, and all of these are all deities. And a deity is a very comfortable understanding of a complex power system, of a complex consciousness, of a, of a tremendous intelligence that can weave not only the details of your life, but hold on to every detail of every life and hold on to the karmic uh, plus and minuses down to every beetle's karma everything is in the memory and everything is perfectly orchestrated and all the orbits of every planet in every galaxy as new ones are being born, everything is held. That intelligence is represented by Saras. So if I start writing the book just using my mind, then I'm using the mind, which is a gift of Saraswati Ishwara, kind of on an autopilot. But when I remember Saraswati or I chant her Bija Mantra or I um, have already developed a relationship, a loving bhakti relationship, a surrendered relationship, then what happens? There is just a divine element. 
you know, I'm on many podcasts and people ask me, what motivated you to like roar like a goddess? And if you've heard me in a couple of them, I always say, it was not premeditated. I premeditated writing my Ayurveda book, Ayurveda Lifestyle Wisdom. I premeditated writing Sovereign Soul because these are these are important topics. And even there I remembered Saraswati. And so they were blessed books. However, there is a time when you understand as the self that your mind is your tool. And sometimes your mind becomes a tool of the collective. It becomes a tool of Ishwar. So I really felt that my body and my mind were utilized to write role. Similarly, when I teach Bhakti Yoga, Karm Yoga, Gyan Yoga, in this systematic manner, I feel like, okay, we are making a record of all these teachings. So that when I've at least done one cycle of teaching to which I'm committed to teaching, if I decide to retire after that or become quiet or go into silence, at least these are recorded. And at that point, I will release them in the world for everyone to have. So it almost feels like when you keep connecting with the power of the deity, it's a little easier. So now the deity, we don't find in the Upanishads a teaching on the deities. We don't. And there is another text called the Brahma Sutras which says, It is helpful to understand the divine allness or the omnipotent Ishvara in the symbol because human beings need sensory symbols. But we should not limit the Ishvara into the symbol. So never should we think that, okay, this murti, this, this murti that I have, this symbol that I have in paper or wood or stone or metal or made of diamonds doesn't matter. This murti alone, this alone is Saraswati or Durga or Shiva or Jesus. This is it. It's okay if you think, okay, it's everywhere and I am connecting with it through this. That is the better way to work with the physical representations of the um, formless consciousness which is each one of course there are you know schools of bhakti which will tell you that god is only krishna or god is only jesus or god is only xyz well i don't want to comment on that with me you can be comfortable that i am telling you the words of the Veda. Vedas do not believe in all this exclusivity. In fact, the Ramayana, <laughs> the Ramayana itself, Rama's epic, was written by a reformed thug. <laughs> so in the Upanishads, we find teachings by prostitutes because Ishwara is latent in all of us, it's dormant in all. And no matter where we've been and how stinking a life we've led of crime or deception or addiction or foolishness, once we sit in the boat of these yogas and we surrender in bhakti to that divine allness, then we start changing every day. That is the promise. So fear not. There is only room to be inclusive. There is no fear. Understand Ishwara is a scientific concept and look at every religion and every religious heart with an eye. Poor things, even those fanatical ones, all they are really trying to do is grab on to some amount of godliness. Um, their faith is not at fault. Their, the foolishness comes in when they think only their faith is important. <laughs> that is just human, that is childlike humanity at play here. One day all humans will realize what the Rig Veda, the oldest Vedic text has already announced that all paths lead to one truth. 
ekam sat. Ekam means one. Sat means true. Ekam sat. Vipraha. Vipraha means the knowers, the knowledgeable ones. Bahuda vadanti. Ekam sat. One truth is bespoken by the scholars or the knowers of divinity by many names. And we will stick with this foundation of the Vedic tradition, the inclusivity. While being grateful to its Hindu roots which allow for this to happen. It's a little easier to pick up the name of one god, male god or female god, or one male and female pair, and just run a whole factory on that. But that's not the purpose. Our purpose is to, to be upset with someone, and yet when we close our eyes, we say, Oh, Ishwara, haven't you come to upset me in this form? If we can have that perception to see Ishwara everywhere, then we are really in the boat of him. So deities and avatars are very much a part of the fabric of Bhakti Yoga because I am basing my teachings of Bhakti Yoga in the original Vedic slash Hindu tradition Therefore, my teachings will be built around the chief deities, beginning with Ganesha. Then we will go into the divine masculine trinity of Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh, or Shiva. Another name for Shiva is Mahesh. And we will go into the divine feminine trinity of Durga, Lakshmi, and Saraswati. Then we will look at their pairings as, as deities and what they reflect about the divine consciousness. We can, I will not be able to expound on Greek deities and other Egyptian deities, but it's for you to explore if that is your tradition. From an avatar perspective, I am already alluding a lot to avatar Krishna's teachings in the Bhagavad Gita. Closer to Diwali, which is a festival connected with Rama, I will bring up some of the gems of bhakti uh, from the Ramayana. The monkey um, avatar of Ishwara is Hanuman. That's a very beloved character in the bhakti movement across the world because Hanuman carried Rama and Sita in his heart. And so he is an epitome of being a, a bhakti yogi. So we will also look at Hanuman. So throughout the year, we will be exploring different deities, not just in the Shraddha session, but also in the mainstream Tuesdays because um, something significant about bhakti will be connected to that deity or that of a time.